Good morning and welcome to the Deanery Garden at Canterbury Cathedral on this Saturday the 7th of May. Welcome wherever you are in the world to this garden which this morning is quite fresh and there's a little rain in the air but it's pleasant sitting here at the moment and uh, bring your own intentions and concerns as together right across the world we pray for the people of Ukraine and for the peace of the world an urgent cry of prayer for peace but that peace can only be in, uh, affected by the intention of people working for peace certainly we pray for those who are giving hospitality to those who fled Ukraine and also for those who today will face the danger the very great danger of war in that land so we keep our prayer burning high as uh, this situation needs resolution for the sake of our whole world. Now, on this Saturday morning, we have come to the orchard area of the garden and it's unrecognisable from the time we sat here surrounded by daffodils because you see how the grass and wild flowers have burgeoned and that we shall allow to happen for some little time yet because there's such a lot of flower still to come. I'm sitting here beside white dead nettle here. We used to suck these little flowers by pulling them out and sucking the end to taste the sweet honey at the bottom of them. And then buttercups here and that too you can hold under your chin to see. The children used to say we see if you like butter as the yellow came onto your onto you, the, the reflection of the sun onto you and uh, cornflowers here beautiful cornflowers but also I've got a mermaid rose near me and behind me a whole sea of Queen Anne's lace quite often called cow parsley blooming at this time of the year one flower takes its 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 cue from another and as one dies away then the cowslips and primroses have died away somewhat uh, and now they've been replaced by a whole multitude of other flowers and the birds are enjoying everything this morning. We have robins, I think probably more than one robin, around flying and singing and lots of blue alkanet still. The alkanet is a long flowering uh, uh, flower so that we shall have that for some time yet. So let's say our prayers on this morning when we take our second reflection about the sense of biblical gardens. But we shall begin with our ordinary prayers for the Easter season on a Saturday morning. Bring your own intentions and concerns. O Lord, open our lips and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. In your resurrection, O Christ, let heaven and earth rejoice. Alleluia. Blessed are you, Lord God of our salvation. To you be praise and glory forever. As once you ransomed your people from Egypt and led them to freedom in the promised land, so now you have delivered us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your risen Son. May we, the first fruits of your new creation, rejoice in this new day you have made and praise you for your mighty acts. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. The night has passed, and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. And as we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Our psalm this morning, on the seventh morning of the month, is Psalm 36. Sin whispers to the wicked in the depths of their heart, for there is no fear of God before their eyes. They flatter themselves in their own eyes that their abominable sin will not be found out. The words of their mouth are unrighteous and full of deceit. They have ceased to act wisely and to do good. They think out mischief upon their beds and have set themselves in no good way, nor do they abhor that which is evil. But your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens and your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness stands like the strong mountains. 
your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, shall save both man and beast. How precious is your loving mercy, O God! All mortal flesh shall take refuge under the shadow of your wings. They shall be satisfied with the abundance of your house. They shall drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the well of life, and in your light shall we see light. O oh, continue your loving kindness to those who know you, and your righteousness to those who are true of heart. Let not the foot of pride come against me, nor the hand of the ungodly thrust me away. There are they fallen, all who work wickedness. They are cast down and shall not be able to stand. A psalm full of glorious images of figurative language to express God's righteousness, God's justice, God's salvation. Your righteousness stands like strong mountains, your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, shall save both humankind and creatures. Verse 6. How precious is your loving mercy, O God! And then even better, the images of refreshment for new life, new growth, which we've seen in abundance in the last few days, as rain has fallen and everything has begun to sprout and glory in the spring, but it needed the water. They shall be satisfied with the abundance of your house. They shall drink from the river of your delights. An image, an earthly image, but in the Garden of Eden there was the river, splitting into four in the end as it went out of the garden. And then, with you is the well of life, and in your light shall we see light. All earthly images, parables in one word, to express something of the divine. So let's come to our lesson for today, and I'm going to read it uh, not in the translation that we normally use, but in the King James Version. And I've got here the piece of paper from 1985, which my secretary Jane Harris in those days uh, typed out for me to read when we committed my mother's ashes to the ground. This was one of her favourite passages, partly because she loves singing the anthem, The Wilderness. And this is Isaiah chapter 35, the whole of chapter 35. And we read that on a, a, a lovely morning in July in the churchyard at home. And here it is, Isaiah chapter 35. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands, and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of dragons where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And an highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, 
but it shall be for those the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. It's a beautiful, poetic passage in figurative language. And it's speaking first and foremost about the wilderness, as in our mind when we think of wilderness, perhaps first we think of a barren area, but not so always, because the next description is the solitary place. Let's go back to yesterday with Walden, how Thoreau found for himself a solitary place where he could learn to know himself in all those different situations by Walden Pond. And here the wilderness and the solitary place are set together. And the capacity of that solitary place by the Spirit of the Lord to blossom like a rose, another picture, is an extraordinary one. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. There's music and it doesn't seem at all odd and we'll come to that again and again in these Old Testament passages for the, the next uh, few days. Um, it doesn't seem at all odd that the trees and the wilderness are said to be singing and this sense of refreshment with you is the well of life, the waters breaking forth, a figurative image, a parable, how at the times of most need, springs of water through God's good agency can break forth and refresh us, who going through the veil of misery use it for a well, and the pools are filled with water, says the psalmist, this sense of everything seeming bleak, and then other whence comes the sense of refreshment, which is heaven's gift. The land sees the glory of the Lord, and strength is given to weak hands, confirmation to feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not, your God will come and save you. And then the prophecy looking forward to the human coming of the Word incarnate made flesh. The eyes of the blind shall be opened. Now we're into Jesus' own ministry. Believe me for the work's sake, he says to them around him. The eyes of the blind shall be opened. The ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame leap like a heart, like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. And there's plentiful imagery here in the garden this morning of what happens when water arrives. We had an experience uh, a, a few years ago now in visiting friends in San Diego and they took us on a drive out to see various places and it was a time when uh, something was happening in, in uh, the United States which caused many of the natural parks and their interpretive centres to be closed and where we were intending to go we stopped off for a moment by one of these it was closed but in fact then the, the, the person on duty uh, who was coming to say I'm afraid it's closed when Fletcher began to talk to him he said, well, why don't you just come in? It became a private visit. And the four of us went in, and uh, the, the two friends uh, whom we were with uh, said where we were intending, he said, I, I wouldn't go there. It, it's had rain, and you, you might find it difficult, even with your four-wheel drive, to get there. So James and Zara said, where shall we go then? And, uh, and she was uh, asking the, the, the person who knew this land well.
We were already in the area of the uh, Anzara Borrego uh, desert and that was uh, a national park. We were excited to be there. We were attempting to get to the Badlands, but in talking to Chris, the, the park ranger there who was helping us, he suggested instead we go to Blair Canyon and he said there's been rain there for the first time for I think six years or so. So you could try that. So off we set and uh, we arrived and crested a ridge and there below us were carpets of flowers in the afternoon sunshine. The desert had blossomed simply because rain had fallen. It was the most wonderful sight and the most wonderful scent of all those flowers. Uh, and, and birds like martins were, were um, skimming across the flowers. And we stopped uh, and Zara, always ready with a picnic, uh, set tea out on the, uh, the tailgate of the, of the, uh, the four-wheel drive. And the three of us, uh, uh, James and Fletcher and I, then climbed higher and higher and looked down on this wonderful, wonderful sight of all those flowers. And as we climbed up, we were very aware of the cliff swallows that were skimming around us. But on the ground and between the plants which had come up through uh, were, was a multiplicity of life, of caterpillars and beetles and things which had been really waiting for this moment of rain. So that the ground is able to, to in desert lands, to, to hold things just for the time when water and refreshment arrive. So we have this, this double image of the wilderness. It's a place of withdrawal and being solitary and having both a mental and a spiritual uh, voyage of self-discovery. Think of the 40 days and 40 nights which Jesus spent in the wilderness, surrounded by the wild creatures, with angels ministering to him, and also temptations coming through to help him know himself, countering them from the strength of his own uh, uh, growing certainty of his vocation as the one who was the anointed one and who would burst into Galilee to bring streams of fresh waters to and in God's gifts after his baptism when the Spirit descended on him coming from the River Jordan. All of those things are encapsulated in this sense of the wilderness and so we must faithfully expect that even in the most dark places and even in the worst places, there are springs of water from the Creator. I'm using a natural image again. There are glimpses of self-discovery. There are glimpses, even in the way we relate to one another, of that kind of gift which the Creator wants us to show. And the lovely passage in the middle of what our Lord was achieving with the eyes of the blind being opened, well, that could be a physical thing, or it could be the eyes of those who have been blind to his own ministry. It could be Nicodemus with Jesus saying, what, can you, a teacher of Israel, not understand this? Uh, and, and all of these things, and teasingly so, I think, with Nicodemus. But at the same time, you've got the, the, the way in which the ears of the deaf are unstopped at last they're hearing what he is actually saying. And he could be talking about the 11 disciples in, in this time following the resurrection, when realization is beginning to dawn, their eyes become opened, their ears to the message unstopped, their tongue loosed. Well, that's a Pentecost message, of course. So to go back to that lovely poem, uh, the sense of the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf be unstopped, then shall the lame leap like a heart. It said that tunes in so much with the, the, the singing and joy, the joy in singing which blossoms in the wilderness. And the, then finally the tongue of the dumb sing. And the tongue, tongue of the dumb really I think is speaking about what happens to the uh, 
the apostles on that first Pentecost day when the Spirit, and very often the waters are signs of the Spirit, the well of life streaming onto this world that it can be then shared, but it can also be ignored and it's easy to go by places where you're thinking this is a, a wilderness place and yet if you look hard then there may be signs of, of glory and refreshment and certainly there are in the garden this morning with this sea of Queen Anne's lace. Now I've got here, this isn't a date, it's a book uh, and it's a book called Orchards Bay which I picked up uh, in I think about uh, 1974 5 or a bit later than that maybe six seven in a bookshop in Ventnor a, a, a second-hand bookshop which was lovely to, when we were on the Isle of Wight it was lovely to go and explore uh, particularly on wet days we think we go into Ventnor today and and uh, perhaps we can call in at the bookshop and I picked this up and set it aside a bit uh, and I noticed that I've written in it a date that I first started to use it, which was in 1985 when I was taking a retreat for people in the Diocese of Salisbury and we'd gone away on retreat. It was a diocesan retreat and I wanted something which expressed the small areas of great landscapes and gardens where we can feel a sense of solitude and self-discovery which this protected space and the silences of that retreat uh, were giving to people. And this book by Alfred Noyes, I took no notice of the man's name and it's, it's, it's later that I've discovered that he was quite a famous poet in the early years of the 20th century. But this isn't about poetry at all, it's simply a description of his own garden with many thoughts and later I discovered that that garden was very near to Ventnor. I discovered it long since I've been to Ventnor so I've never been there to that particular uh, space but his house was in the undercliff and obviously there was a most marvellous garden uh, looking over Orchards Bay. Well so the name is good for here with us in the orchard this morning and the chapters of the book go from place to place to place in this garden which he and his wife and they were very devout Catholics uh, and they traveled the world because he was he was a famous writer in those days but at the same time they loved creating this garden looking out over the channel from the Isle of Wight at Ventnor and as you read it he intersperses things with memories as we do morning by morning uh, and bits of poetry and images and as I go through the book I get a picture of what that garden was like but uh, I wanted this morning to go to a passage which talked about a little garden how we like to create in gardens somewhere we, where we can go and, and find ourselves both protected and refreshed. Earlier this year he writes at Assisi Two enclosed gardens made a lasting impression upon me. We'd gone by road from Rome to Assisi and noted on the way that in all that beautiful countryside there was never a bird to be seen or heard, flying or singing. It makes a strange silence in the land, a melancholy silence for those who are used to the brook-like warblings and chucklings of an English wood, which you've got all around you this morning. We had journeyed all day as I have said, without seeing or hearing a bird of any kind in all that beautiful country and then, unexpectedly, a strange thing happened. In the afternoon, when we were only a few miles from Assisi, a small bird suddenly flew across the road. A minute or two later, several more rose in a field. We halted for a moment and heard a few silvery notes in a clump of trees after arriving at Assisi, we went into that stillest of all enclosed gardens, the garden within the monastery, once a burial place, and only a few yards above and beyond the tomb of St Francis. There, in the late afternoon, his little brothers and sisters, the birds, whole flocks of them, were pouring their hearts out in joy, 
the branches were alive with birds, his feathered choirs continuing his own canticle of praise as though in memory of their friend beyond the centuries. And there was one unseen chorister in particular among the highest boughs, lifting up his voice to the last of the sun. There were birds all about us, you see, on that March day, and in one bare room, austere in everything that concerned its human owners, there had been swallows' nests under the rafters, year after year, generation after generation, and the windows were wide open, awaiting their return. It was a quiet and beautiful instance of the way in which the influence of one man can make itself felt through the ages. Francis had loved God's creatures, and now, after all those centuries, there was not a musical ripple that did not seem to return to his love and remember him. Indeed, a presence more immediate, more vital than memory, seemed to have annihilated clock time altogether, and to be here and now breathing his own kindliness over his native place like a benediction. It was not a miracle except in the sense that everything is a miracle and ultimately inexplicable. But another wonder stole upon the mind and heart as one emerged from that little garden within the monastery of San Francesco. Many of those high, isolated, hill-cresting towns of Italy, at first sight and from the plains below, have a wild beauty which on a nearer approach and in the common light of day turns to something almost drab and sordid, that the little city, clasping its crags like the castle of a warrior king, turns to a dilapidated warren of mean streets with the plaster peeling off the walls and lines of washing strung against landscapes that remember Giotto. The moderns console themselves with the discovery that the washing itself is paintable, and so of course it is. But there the matter ends for them. But there was nothing of this in Assisi. The glorious position and aspect of San Francesco itself on its great pro promontory would alone be enough to hallow everything within its majestic horizon. Moreover, Assisi is built entirely of the clean stone of its own mountain quarries, but in the steep winding streets there was at first a certain bleakness, which I had hardly expected after the glorious vision from the plain below. The houses on that March afternoon, with a raw wind swooping round them, St Francis knew that wind, had looked grey and cold. But now, as we emerge from San Francesco after sunset, Assisi was transfigured. Although it was quite early in the evening, the steep little winding streets were all deserted and silent, and the subdued light, beyond all expectation, brought out an exquisite secret colour ethereal tints of peach bloom, the colour of the fruit, not the flower, suffusing the soft pallor of the Assisi stone. The occasional lamps in their beautiful wrought iron brackets, little lighted windows, open but curiously hushed, with only here and there a faint sound of voices, like voices heard in a dream, deepened and enriched this ethereal transformation. Flowers in the windows of the children of men, a little shrine in a wall with flowers at the feet of that other mother and child. Imagine, if you can, the Cannon Gate of Edinburgh transmuted into a clean winding stair for angels, for this is what Assisi becomes night after night at sundown. It was no longer a city of this world, and when one emerged through the old gateway onto the height commanded by those tall cypresses and felt rather than saw the dark depths of the valley below, the mountain and the climbing city were isolated in a new and more vital sense. The deep bell of San Francesco suddenly spoke in the stillness. It was announcing not the hour, but things changeless and eternal. The next day, in broad noon, I saw what must be the smallest and in some ways the loveliest garden in the world, the Garden of St. Clair at the convent of San Damieno. You walk through a dark and narrow passage in the convent itself, ascend a few steps, open a battered old door and find yourself in a tiny balcony, no larger than a box at a theatre, with high walls on three sides and a ledge waist high in front of you upon which there is a window box of various carefully tended flowers. There are one or two flowering creepers, that is all, 
except that from that narrow enclosure and across that tiny garden of the Friend of St Francis, you look down upon one of the most beautiful prospects in the world. To emerge from the dark convent and see beyond and far below that narrow ledge of flowers, the immense plain of Umbria, and to know that the little sloping field immediately under the balcony is the very place where St Francis composed his Canticle to the Sun, is to discover a new glory in the phrase, a garden enclosed. Much has been written in praise of a certain balcony scene at Verona in one of the loveliest works of Shakespeare. Generation after generation has felt the spell of that imagined scene when the tips of the fruit trees were silvered by the moon over Capulet's orchard. But here, in real life, over this little flowering ledge, many more centuries ago, a pledge was given deeper than any that the inconstant moon of the poet ever witnessed. One tall cypress, a few yards away from the little garden of St. Clair, stands up against the dim blue distances and invisible vineyards of the wide gulf below. The sharpness of the tree, like a dark aspiring flame, accentuating the ethereal softness of the remote background. It is the image of Clare's own love, her own austerity, her own renunciation and sacrifice. A dark column, the silent form of a nun, gazing over the wide sunlit world of earthly beauty. She stood there, silently, motionless, hearing not only that canticle from the narrow and stony acre of rough, sun-flooded stubble below her, but in her heart, the cry of a deeper passion than Shakespeare ever dreamed of. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. Well, those of you who know Assisi will not be surprised by any of that, and I've shared with you before that experience I had sitting with my back against the wall right below that balcony she's talking about and having spent an hour or two reflecting on my time at Assisi so far, that was on my first visit, uh, then I was joined, if you remember, by a nun who was on holiday from France and came and sat with me and we talked wonderfully for half an hour or so and then when we left uh, I said to her, um, shall I take your contact? And she said, well, yes, but that's not what is important. We'll pray for one another. That's where the importance of this lies. Everything else is, is completely uh, different. And so as she walked away, I felt I had been absolutely blessed. I'd never met her since, but I was sitting there looking at that very scene described right across the plains, sitting in the spot where Francis wrote his Canticle of the Sun. So the transformation of a wilderness through refreshment, spiritual refreshment, becomes something that we need. And coming apart into solitary places becomes an absolutely essential part of our spiritual life. Let's give thanks then for places where we can find that kind of refreshment. But let's say our prayers on this Saturday morning in Eastertide. And we are praying today for the uh, Diocese of Lesotho in the Anglican Church of South Africa. In the diocese here, we pray for Justin, our Archbishop, for Rose, Bishop of Dover, and uh, for Emma, Bishop at Lambeth. Uh, and today for, um, with the diocese, a, a general prayers are given for mission and ministry. So that we do for the whole church throughout the world. Bring your own prayers as we say this collect for this week, for the last time, a new one for tomorrow. Almighty Father, who in your great mercy gladdened the disciples with the sight of the risen Lord, give us such knowledge of his presence with us that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life and serve you continually in righteousness and truth through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And each in our own language now, the prayer our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Moment of reflection now on this Saturday morning in Eastertide for all of us to say our prayers or think our thoughts and hopefully be refreshed. by you, crashing round you like an avalanche. You don't hear a word, you don't feel the spirit brushing your cheek. You don't see the flowers in the wilderness, la da di da di da di da di da Flowers in the wilderness, you just pass them by. All flowers in the wilderness, it only takes a second. If you only stop to see and hear them fly In the distance you can see them throwing colors to the wind They're rolling on the wheels forever turning When you look out at the rain there's always one drop that flashes in your eye In the crowded street you won't see an angel crossing as the world swells around you like a tide into a precipice uh, You don't hear a word You don't feel the spirit kissing your face You don't see the flowers in the wilderness uh, da -di -da -di -da -di -da -di -da. Flowers in the wilderness You just pass them by Flowers in the wilderness It only takes a second If you only stop to see them fly By you crashing round you like an avalanche You don't hear a word You don't feel the spirit brushing your cheek You don't see the flowers in the wilderness la la di da di da di da di da Flowers in the wilderness You just pass them by oh, Flowers in the wilderness It only takes a second if you only stop to see him fly That song, Flowers in the Wilderness, sung by the wonderful and blues rock Australian singer-songwriter, written by him too, uh, Andrew Barnum uh, gives us the sense of suddenly spotting the beauty of flowers in what seemed to be a barren wilderness. And take time to appreciate the beauties of the world and not simply to race past them on a different agenda and miss the gift that they bring. So we give thanks for the music and song this morning. The God of peace who brought again from the dead 
our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you, upon those whom you love, and those whom you would pray for today and always. Amen. Well, we're promised a little bit more rain this morning and then a fine afternoon, but we've escaped the rain as we've said our prayers and before I go into the cathedral for matins on a Saturday morning, let's go do our riddle answers. Uh, and yesterday we asked, I wear a red coat and have a stone in my throat. What am I? The answer is a cherry. And I drive away my customers but they are still happy to pay me. What am I? And the answer to that is a taxi driver, a cab driver. Uh, two for this morning. Saturday puzzlers. My teeth are sharp and my back is straight. To cut things up is my fate. What am I? And then, I am sometimes light and sometimes dark and swim amongst the twinkling lights. Seas and oceans obey me, but mountains I cannot move. What am I? And finally, our classical fable. And uh, here we are. <laughs> Beautiful picture, frighten the fish to death, of the heron and the fish looking up there. And our, our pond here is covered by a net uh, and I'm looking across there but it protects from a heron, for heron have sharp eyes for any fish and will come down and snap them up. It's called simply the heron, this fable. A heron went wading one early morning to take his breakfast from the shallows of a stream. There were many fish in the water, but the stately heron thought he could find better. Such small fry is certainly not suitable fare for a heron, he remarked to himself. And as a choice young perch swam by, the heron tipped his long bill in the air and snapped, No, sir, I certainly wouldn't open my beak for that. The sun grew higher, and all the fish left the shallows for the cool, deep middle of the stream. When the heron could find no trace of a fish left in the stream, he was very grateful to finally break his fast on a mere snail. And the, uh, the moral, do not be too hard to suit or you may have to be content with the worst or with nothing at all. Well, that's the heron with the fish. Tomorrow uh, we have my favourite Aesop's fable of all and uh, we'll come to that tomorrow. Meanwhile, enjoy your Saturday as we shall, but I'll go and start it first of all in the cathedral.